In the Ivy Hill Cemetery in Cedarbrook, Philadelphia, there sits a large plot kept mostly covered in stuffed animals donated by local families and visitors. The headstone reads, America's Unknown Child, a permanent reminder of the child who lies beneath it. He was found dead and alone in a box, and no one could identify him. The case of the boy in the box is one of Philadelphia's most baffling murder cases, stumping police for over 60 years. Now, this was written in 2021. It leaves, still today, hundreds of unanswered questions. In February of 1957, a young muskrat hunter set out to check his traps near just north of Philadelphia. As he moved through the brush, he found a small cardboard box lying on the ground. This is it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking every time I read about this and every time I think about this story because they have photographs of this child and and you can tell that he's visibly been... Um, he's not had an easy life of, uh, to be just a small child. He's He's been just horribly beaten, it looks like. Bruised. His face is bruised. His mouth is cuts. Inside, the man found the naked body of a small boy wrapped in a plaid blanket. Fearing that the police would confiscate his traps if he alerted them to the box, the young hunter ignored it and continued hunting. What's wrong with people? Several days later, a college student driving down the road noticed a bunny running alongside the highway. The student knew there were traps in the area and stopped to make sure the animal was safe. As he sifted through the brush searching for traps, he came across the box. Given that the boy was young, between three and seven years old, police were hopeful that he would be quickly identified. However, once they saw the body, their hopes were dashed. While police, while people would surely be looking for a small missing boy who was healthy, where well cared for and clearly loved, this was not the case. This child looked scrawny, dirty, malnourished, and his hair was matted and seemed to have been recently cut in clumps. But it shows you, you can see the hair, and it looks like parts of his hair have been shaved off. He has hair, but it's like clumps have been shaved or have fallen out maybe from the malnutrition his body was so severely malnourished and covered with surgical scars most notably on his ankle groin and chin despite the fact that he looked abandoned police fingerprinted him hoping to find a match and sadly they never did over the next several years, over 400,000 flyers were sent out in the Philadelphia area as well as surrounding towns in Pennsylvania. A forensic facial reconstruction was done and a drawing of a happy young boy was included on all of the posters. Flyers were posted in police stations, post office, and some were even mailed out along with people's gas bills, etc., hoping that someone would recognize the child. The crime scene itself was searched several times, but apart from several items of children's clothing, which all led nowhere, there were no leads. To this day, the boy's identity remains as much a mystery as it did in 1957. Though the case was has run cold, the publicity and interest in the case throughout the years has grown. Investigators have turned up on notable theories throughout the years. Theory number one. In 1960, an employee of a medical examiner's office was told by a psychic that the boy in the box had come from a local foster home. The police inquired about the boy at the foster home and found blankets similar to the one he had been wrapped in hanging on the clothesline as well as a bassinet that was sewed in the same type of box that the boy had been found. 
It's po it, the fact that the blankets and the box matched is a very good indication that he may have come from this foster home. I don't know if these people at this foster home were questioned. The employee theorized that the boy had been born to the daughter of the man who ran the foster home and that his death had been accidental. Despite the employee's insistence of these facts, no connection was ever made between the boy in the box and the foster home. It wasn't until around 40 years later that another shocking theory emerged. A artist drew this photograph of the child based on his bone structure, and this is what they came up with. Um... Theory number two, a woman referred to only as M came forward claiming that the boy had been purchased by her abusive mother and had been abused for several years in the home. M claimed that after the boy vomited up his dinner of baked beans, her mother had bashed his head against the wall as punishment, and later when she attempted to bath him, he died. The police initially followed this lead as there were remains of baked beans in the boy's stomach and his fingers appeared to have been water wrinkled. Those were both pieces of information that were never shared with the public. They were also encouraged by M's description of the boy as a small child with long hair. This fit the theory that his hair had been recently chopped as well as an old testimony from a man who claimed to see the boy around the area where his body was later found. The facts reported by M, the precise and exact details that she gave, should have been required through an investigation regardless of her mental disorder. She belonged to a well-to-do family and their high social status may explain why the neighbors' comments and the abandonment by police to investigate this further. The boy in the box was found on Tuesday, February the 26th, 1957. He was white and estimated to be between four and seven years old, approximately 40 inches tall and weighed only 30 pounds. He was malnourished and he had many bruises and seven scars. The scars may have been surgical scars. He was circumcised and had blonde hair. He was found wrapped in a torn blanket placed in a cardboard box that once held a J.C. Penney bassinet in the Fox Chase section of Philadelphia. Sev several of the original detectives searched for the boy's identi identity until their deaths at old age. Every school enrollment list vaccination report, and social services call in the Philadelphia area was scrutinized. Tens of thousands of baby footprint cards were examined, and multiple similar-looking missing children were located alive. Well, at least they did that much, you know. While they were trying to figure out who this child was, they were able to find some other missing children. In June of 2002, the Philadelphia Inquirer reported that a witness was interviewed by the detectives. The witness insisted upon remaining anonymous. She was referred to only as M. She reported that her mother, who was a librarian in the Tony suburb of Marion, Pennsylvania, had purchased the boy in August of 1954. M said the boy was intellectually disabled. He reported that in February of 1957, her mother hauled the boy upstairs for a bath. M was ordered to cut the boy's fingernails, which she tried to do neatly. The boy had vomited up some baked beans, and M's mother beat the boy to death in a violent rage. M's mother and father then cut off most of the boy's hair, placing the boy in the trunk of the car. M's mother drove 
herself and M to Fox Chase to dump the boy's body. Cutting to the chase, I figured out who M is. But since M is, as far as I know, alive and well, I will not, I will not dox her as she is now an elderly woman. I found this information from public records and clues available online. I am not a police officer. I do not have access to any confidential information. The timeline reports that M's mother bought the boy in August of 1954, and the boy was murdered in 1957. He would have lived with M's family for around two and a half years. He had a full set of baby teeth, and he was likely to have been five to six years of age at the time of his death. M claimed her mother was employed as a librarian. This is true. Let's call the mother Jane. Jane graduated college. At the time that the boy would have lived with the family, Jane was working at a local high school as a librarian. She had a, earned a master's degree in library sciences and specialized in local document collections. She worked in several local libraries, including the university. M's father was a high school science teacher. This is true. M's father taught science. He published scientific papers for several decades. Father and mother married in the late 1930s. M's parents lived in the lower Marion area of Philadelphia at the time of the boy's murder. Um, let's call the house in question 100 Clue Street. I cannot confirm that M's family lived there in 1957, but I can confirm that the family lived in an apartment that was on Clue Street in 1950. I confirmed through property records that M's parents lived there until 1967. A few years after this husband died, she sold the house. The house has been sold several times since this. This goes back to the theory that um, the police didn't investigate this because these people were were well known. Um, he was a scientist at the university, a science teacher, taught at the high school, and also worked for the university publishing papers. She worked for the high school and the university as a librarian, a document um, producing and and um, they were, they were well-known, and they were well-affluent people. Here are some more claims. M's parents are now dead. Matthew died at the age of 68, and Jane lived until she was 85 years old. This has been verified by death records. Um, claim, M was sexually abused by her father and a circle of friends. I cannot verify this. Detective Gillen, who was one of the detectives on the case and spoke to him, specified that some of the parents' friends were pedophiles. Is it possible that they bought the child for that very purpose? That this father was a pedophile and just, you know, I don't know. There's just too much evil in this world for me to even understand M graduated from Lower, Lower Marion High School. She was involved in extracurricular activities and played on two sports teams. She also played a musical instrument and attended college after she graduated from high school. Assuming M does have any kind of mental illness, it could be anything from depression to post-traumatic stress disorder. However, her School history shows no signs that she suffered from any type of mental handicap. She was able to obtain a Ph.D. and work for a major pharmaceutical company. No one who worked with her ever reported in any of her charting that she had any type of mental illness. Uh, the fact that she saw a psychiatrist doesn't mean she was mentally ill. Um, it probably was just that she was suffering from this 
these memories and, you know, not being taken seriously and knowing that no one ever investigated this, you know. There are no gaps in her work history. She did not suffer from any gaps in her education history. Detectives interviewed her again in May of 2002. It's obvious from old and recent photographs that M is a tall, athletic woman. Her father was also very tall, six foot two. Um, it's it's doubtful that she suffered from malnutrition, based on photographs and her weight recorded, at in like her school records and such. Um, her name was partially leaked to the news media. It appears that a local police official accidentally blurted out her name in an interview. Um, maybe it wasn't an accident. Maybe this police detective was fed up with the cover-up of this story, and maybe they just wanted somebody to finally go and, and really start looking at this these people um, evidence supporting claims M was truthful about her parents identities work histories and the location of her childhood home um, the boy's body was spotted by John Powell Solnick a local high school student on Sunday February the 24th at around 1.30 p.m. His family had immigrated here from Russia. After leaving, he feared being reported for illegally hunting. I guess maybe if you came from Russia and you had fled the Iron Curtain, as it's said here, you might be fearful of the police and maybe you would be afraid that you would be accused of something. So I guess maybe I can kind of understand a little bit now why he didn't go to the police. Um, the next person to discover the body was a college student named Frederick Benoit at 3.15 p.m. on Monday the 25th. Benoit had stopped to set some animals free from some traps on in the same location. Um, the next day... At 10 a.m., he anonymously called the Philadelphia Police Department to report finding the body. Shortly after that, Patrolman Elmer Palmer was dispatched and found the body in the box. The boy's exact cause of death is unclear, and we believe that it is intentionally not released by the police. The autopsy report has never been released to the public. Although, police say he had no broken bones, he had no healed fractures. Various news articles say he died of head trauma. Okay, let's see, let's get back to this. People who physically and sexually abuse children under their care. M's parents were both teachers and had access to young children. M's father started teaching years before she was born. There may have been many more victims of both her parents. And she said that they had a circle of friends who were all pedophiles. So, was it just her and the brother that were being sexually abused this whole time? Or were other children being brought in? And, you know, if this is even true, her psychiatrist believed it enough that they came forward to the police with, with her claims. Um, M alleged that her mother murdered the boy after sexually abusing, starving, and torturing him from August 1954 to February 1957. He deserves a name. M is now, now keep in mind this was written five years ago. M is now a senior citizen while the stigma around mental health treatment still exists, 
it's less so now than it was at that time. She no longer works. She is retired. And if Emma is still living, I would beg her. Well, at this time, the, this writer is saying that from their investigation, as of five years ago, this person was still living. Um, I beg her to come forward and give a name to this child to let people know so that maybe they would be able to figure out who he actually was. Lou Romano and Jim Hoffman, who came across the lead from a man who rented his house, who said he sold his son. A forensic pathologist examined photos of the potential father and brother and found similarities in facial structure. A DNA sample was taken from the potential bro brother. Oddly, investigators refused to say whether the DNA test compared to the brother to the boy in the box. They would only say that there were further investigations. Um, this is from Augustine went to the home of author Nicoletti, the man who formerly owned and operated the foster home. Nicoletti's wife, Anne Maria, was the woman Bristow theorized to be the mother of the boy in the box. A psychiatrist in Cincinnati who contacted detectives about one of her patients named Martha. It's probably M. She said Martha insisted on speaking to the police because she claimed her mother took her to a house where she handed an envelope of money over for a boy who was when she was 11 years old. Martha spoke with investigators stating that she was sexually abused by both her parents and that they did the same thing to the little boy. She also claimed that they beat the little boy to death. According to investigators, Martha's story added up, but even after the lead, the police were not able to verify her claims. They didn't, they were not unable to verify their claims. They just dis, dismissed them away. They never pick a fight with people who buy ink by the barrel. This means newspaper reporters. But there is so much misinformation and shoddy reporting on this case. That is why I use public records to write this article. Um... The details of this case were verified before publication, but not all of the detectives were quoted were reached to confirm their remarks. Of one of the most devastating unsolved murders. His identity and that of his killer remains unknown, but many people say this is a case and a life that should not be forgotten. Whatever the circumstances, this poor little boy was left abandoned and alone. And over the past 65 years, there have been thousands of hours devoted to finding out who he was. Um, there is a plaque on the 700 block in Philadelphia that, block, that marks the spot where the boy was found. Ivy Hill Cemetery on the outskirts of North Philadelphia is the final resting place for hundreds. Inside you will find a grave marked only boy in the box. Um, trinkets and flowers are left for the victim daily. Cemetery workers meticulously care for the grave. One man who works at the cemetery said it would be great if we knew who we were putting these flowers out for. For right now, he remains a boy without a name. That's the biggest mystery right now, say police homicide detectives. His identity coldly tied to the de co coldly tied to the detail his battered remains were found in a box. Who is this child? Can we at least give him a name? A veteran homicide detective, Kulmir, has kept the investigation alive. 
The elusive nature of the case haunts him. He remembers growing up in this neighborhood when he was 10 years old is when this boy's body was found. The cause of death is listed as blunt force trauma. He appeared to be clean and freshly groomed and with a haircut. The, this girl told in this article on Reddit that her mother asked her to cut the boy's fingernails. Did she also ask her to cut the boy's hair? Um, maybe they bought the child because they knew he was mentally handicapped and they thought that way they could have them a sexual abuse victim for life and he would never be able to go tell anybody. I don't know. Police homicide detectives decided to exhume the remains of the boy in the box. What they were able to retrieve was DNA that was sent to a lab in Europe. This has given them their biggest break. This is the closest we have ever gotten. You know now when people give their DNA to these genealogy bases, websites, they say that they can trace your um, heritage, like if you were German or if you were like if your ancestors were African or Samoan or Chinese or whatever they can tell by your traits in your DNA I don't know how all that stuff works but um, police now have a DNA profile that gives them hope that they may be able to find family members to this little boy so now that DNA is in the databases if anyone years from now or through the years has given their DNA um, and you know maybe this father was a scientist is it possible that if this story is true that this was a ring of pedophiles and we all know that this exists we all know that these people exist we all know um, that they cover up for each other. We all know about uh, Jeffrey Epstein and all these politicians and actors who are involved in this type of stuff, and it's all covered up. At this time, these teachers and scientists and, and, and people in the community like this, they were, they were looked up to and thought of as contributing and this takes me back to my theory about the Catholic Church and all the cover-ups that took place and, and it was it came out years ago when people finally started coming out and talking about it so it's sad to think that there are people like this in the world and it's sad to think that they have their little organizations and groups, and it's um, that the police, the church, helped conceal this because this this man and his wife were both well known um, educators, librarian. They were well known. They probably ran in circles of well to do people and um, probably contributed to the church and contributed to. The community. And this is probably one reason why this was all hush hush. He had seven scars. Two of them were on his chest and appeared to be to have healed very well, leaving only one hairline trace, while the third was on his left ankle and looked to have been a cut down incision. He had no vaccination scars on his body. His right palm and the soles of his feet were round and wrinkled as though he had been in the water. His esophagus contained dark brown residue, which meant he had vomited. This leads us back to the story the sister told that he had vomited up his dinner of baked beans. The medical examiner determined the boy had died from blunt force trauma and there were four round-shaped bruises on his forehead, and his face was blood-drained. 
The medical examiner conducted x-ray imaging and found that he suffered from arrested growth, most likely due to malnutrition and abuse. He was fingerprinted, and they cross-checked his fingerprints, hoping to find that he was a missing child, but they were not able to. They believe he was possibly born at home, not in a hospital. However, that takes us back to the circumcision. He was probably born in a hospital. They probably just didn't, they didn't have the types of databases and things like they have now where they can just put it into a computer and it just feeds them the information back in 30 seconds. Um... It is believed that the child had suffered from a chronic eye ailment or infection before he died. He also had been circumcised and had numerous small moles all over his body, including on his face and ear. Despite all the abuse suffered by this child, someone had kept his fingernails and toenails trimmed. None of this was released to the police or to the public by the police at this time. And this girl comes forward and tells them that she cut his fingernails neatly. She tells them that he ate baked beans and threw up, and that was the reason the mother got mad and brought him upstairs to give him a bath to wash away the vomit. It, it all makes sense, and I do believe that this story on Reddit is, is who this child is. It's who the family and the murderer and the person that covered this up. But who was the child? None of these clues ever provided anything to advance the investigation. A strand of long brown hair was found at the scene. We know that this did not belong to the child. People traveled from across the country in an attempt to identify him. An article describing the boy's scars and injuries was published in the pediatric journal in case any physician who had treated a young boy for these types of injuries might come forward. Police went around to all the foster homes, orphanages, and hospitals, but found that no child was unaccounted for. Well, they went on tail. They also released a post-mortem image of the child dressed in a seated position in hopes that it would jog the memory. Uh, I'm going to show you this. If you don't want to see it, close your eyes. This is the actual child, dead, posed in a outfit. They did this in the hopes that someone would recognize the child even though the child is dead, and it just looks like a little... An estate sale at the foster home, they discovered a bassinet that matched the one that would have been in the box where the boy's body was found. Um, his theory was that the boy belonged to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the foster home and that they disposed of his body because she was a young, unwed mother, but that doesn't make any sense, because this child was six years old at least. Did they keep the child for six years and then decide to dis to dispose of him? It goes back to the story about this girl named Martha, who claimed that her abusive mother had purchased the child, whose name was Jonathan. Um... She purchased the child from his birth parents in the summer of 1954. The boy was subjected to extreme physical and sexual abuse for two and a half years. One evening at dinner, the boy began to vomit up his dinner, and the mother became so irate that she gave him a severe beating, hitting his head against the wall, and he fell unconscious. Um, at that time... Martha was instructed to help give the boy a bath. This was when she cut his fingernails. 
she reported that the boy had long hair because his hair had never been cut because he was kept indoors all the time. And that at, upon his death, her mother instructed her to cut the boy's long hair in an effort to conceal his identity. Her mother forced her to help dump the boy's body in the Fox Chase area. Um, a passing male motorist pulled up alongside of them as they were loading the boy's body in the box into the back of the car and asked if they needed assistance. Her mother told her to stand in front of the license plate and told the would-be Good Samaritan that they didn't need his help. Um, a male subject came forward later and told the police that he was the man in the story that he had stopped when he had seen these two women trying to load this box into the trunk of a car and asked if they needed his help. Police say that they believe Martha's story is credible, but that she also has a history of mental illness. Well, see, that's stupid right there. Um, she has given them more evidence and details that match than anything else. And they keep saying that she has a mental illness. I'm telling you all right now, this is my theory that this was a cover-up of this father and mother's um, jobs and the types of people that they were friendly with and this so-called pedophile ring, it's its just, I, I truly believe that this was all hush-hush and cover it up and keep quiet about it and let these people get by. And, and I'm going to finish this up right here because I know this video has run much longer than I had intended. In 2016, two writers from Los Angeles, California, wrote an article that they believed had helped discover the identity of this child and that they believed him to be from Memphis, Tennessee, requested that DNA be compared to family members. The lead was originally discovered by a Philadelphia man who introduced Romano and Hoffman, these are the writers, and they were able to develop this investigation with the help of the police department and the retired police officers. Romano became aware of the lead and agreed to help. In 2014, information was quickly sent to the Philadelphia Police Department. Local authorities confirmed that they would investigate, but said they would need to do more research. Yeah, of course they do. They're just hoping everybody dies off and that this is swept under the rug and never discovered. This was after the boy's body had been exhumed and DNA had been taken. Um, police now have a DNA profile to go on to help them with, to help potentially find family members who may be related to this child. Um, I'm going to wrap this up and just say that I personally believe that this child did belong to this woman, this Martha. The story that she tells, I believe this to be true. Um, because of the theory that they kept this covered up and didn't really deeply investigate it because of who the parents were, their positions in the community. What a big scandal it might bring forth with not only these two people, but others who were their friends and colleagues and who may possibly have been involved in this boy's abuse. I'll stand by that because you can Google and go look up all these children who were abused they came forward by the thousands and um, it was probably a lot easier to cover all this stuff up way back then because they didn't have the internet and instant phone people pulling their phones out and recording everything 
But I hope that someday this boy's body or this boy's identity is found. And I guess right now I just say that this girl said that they called him Jonathan. So as sad as it is, he his death probably was a um, was the best thing that could have happened for this child because who knows. Who knows what abuses he did suffer and would have suffered. And it's just sad.